Welcome, Rachel. Thank you. Pleasure to have you. My pleasure. <laughs> I heard your name from my daughter who said that you spoke at her school and she was blown away by your story and the lessons that, that she learned. And I knew that that was probably a story that our listeners would really appreciate hearing. So I know there's many different parts. So let's start, I would say, at maybe a pivotal moment in your life or a crossroads, and then we can, you know, go from there. So probably, I, I would say I had a few pivotal moments, but I'll start by sharing with you the main one, of course, that really was in my late 20s that led me to making this 180 degree turn, this change in my life. Um, I I was a socialite at that time. Um, and I had a, I had a clothing store in South Beach. I was really what I would, what one would say would call on top of the world. Um, after searching for so many years for an identity, I really felt that I had found my identity. I knew who I was. I knew what was wanted and expected from me. Um, not in a spiritual sense, but in a purposeful sense. And that was to be a stylist to celebrities, to have a store that celebrities would frequent and have a client base that needed me, that that made me feel needed. They needed me to go on stage. They needed me to go on the red carpet. And as a socialite, I was needed to be the life of the party. They needed me there. And this pivotal moment happened um, when I actually attended a an exclusive private VIP event. It was a private VIP dinner. And I remember sitting at a long, long table um, with a bunch of Italians, that m- male and female, that I was in this very tight circle of, of uh, affluent Italians in South Beach. And I was sitting at the table and somebody was sitting across the table from me. And they looked at me and they said, what is your name? And at that time, I went by Rachel. So I said, my name is Rachel. And they looked at me again and they said to me, what is a good Jewish girl like you doing here? And I I remember being a little bit jolted because I hadn't thought or identified as the fact that I was a Jewish girl possibly ever. I can't even say to you, oh, in many, many years, I was 27, 26 years old, never even identified as that. And I turned to this person who I have absolutely no idea their name, who they were. I was there to be socialite, you know, dressed to the nines. And I said, you know, how do you know I'm a, how do you know that I'm a Jewish girl? And this person said to me, really, you're not fooling anyone. I don't know. I, I, I look back even till today and I, I think to myself, what was it about me? that I gave that off. Now, granted, this person was a Jewish person, was a Jewish man, so clearly, who had grown up in a from home. I was going to ask if he was Jewish. He was Jewish. He had grown up in a from home. He was not living a from lifestyle at that point. I don't know where he's holding today. Be fascinated to find out. But a very good, a very good-natured person who must have been, it had been ingrained in him from an early age to read a neshama. Uh, that's, I mean, I'm making that up, of course, but one would think that. And so he was able to read and see right through me and almost see that I didn't belong there. And the reality is that I didn't. It just took something like that to jolt me. Um, and so at that pivotal moment where someone said that to me, it's not like I just walked up, left the party, <laughs> and went and looked for the closest Chabad house. Clearly, I did not do that. But it must have set something in me because that person asked me, this gentleman asked me if I would attend a Shabbos meal. I had never gone to a, a true, call it Orthodox Shabbat meal. And when he asked me, it sounded intriguing to me. It sounded interesting to me, perhaps jolting inside of me that I was a Jewish girl. Shouldn't I, shouldn't I see what that's like? And so in order for me to go to that meal, I... I wanted to do what I did at all times. When, it, when anybody invited me to anything, you should know, I when it was a red carpet event, when it was a specific type of party, or if I was going, they invited me to go to Italy or to go to London or to go to Las Vegas. I always was very into like dressing the part and being the part. I felt like I'm not, I, was, I, I wasn't still that girl. If I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it right. And I have to play the part well. So I remember saying to myself, okay, if I'm going to go to the Shabbos meal, 
um, I have to know what to do, how to act, what to wear, what to say. And so I knew at that time I had owned a clothing store in South Beach. And I knew at the time that my neighbor was a Shomer Shabbos girl. I only knew that because she closed her store every Friday night. And I was used to her customers coming next door into my boutique to ask me, why is the store next door closed? I mean, this was the height of South Beach. You didn't close your store at 5.30 p.m. ranging till 8 p.m. during season. And I would say to them, oh, she closes her store early. I didn't explain to these people this is a religious Jewish girl. And so I knew exactly who to go to to ask, what do I do at a Shabbat meal, at a proper Orthodox meal? Tell me what to wear. Tell me how to speak. What should I speak about? How do I eat? Is there any customs that I should know so I'm prepared? That's ama- what's amazing is that what we would normally hear is, let's say, I was searching for something. So I was already searching and looking, and then I found this thing. What you're saying is that I found my purpose. I was in that place where I was serving, which is a need. You know, when, we, when we're looking for our purpose, we want to do something that can be of service to others, benefit others. You were in a good place. But then something jolted you. Yes. That's very rare. The question is, were you really in a good place? Like when you look back now, do you think you were in a good place? Absolutely not. (laughs) I I if I could share the the things I was doing were were definitely not things to write home about. Um and besides for that, physically speaking, those things, spiritually speaking and emotionally speaking, I was not in a good place. Emotionally, I like to tell people that it looked so good on the outside to a point that I could even mask it. I, I felt good, but then I would have these, these lows where when I was going home at night, at not, not at night, at the early hours of the morning, 2 a.m., 3 a.m., I was alone and I was going home to my, my teeny tiny adorable apartment on Ocean Drive in South Beach and I would feel lonely. And I was just not mature enough at that time to ask myself, Why am I feeling so lonely if I just left a party of 200 people or 800 people? I mean, depending on where I was, was it VIP, was it not? But why? Why am I feeling lonely if I just left being surrounded by so many people? Yet I wasn't. I wasn't feeling fulfilled and I did feel lonely in a, in a physical sense. These, these type, this type of lifestyle that I had, it didn't boost my self esteem. If anything, it made it worse. I had, apps, I had to stay, you know, a certain size. I had to look a certain way. I had to purchase certain luxury goods that maybe I, sometimes I could afford them, but maybe other times I couldn't. I had to like what, what we call, let's say we use the expression keeping up with the Jones. That, that wasn't easy. That was difficult. Sometimes I was happy to do it and sometimes I wasn't in the mood, but I didn't have a choice. I still had to go and I had to do all the physical things to keep myself on par with the lifestyle I had. So, you know, either going back to what you mentioned, it is really interesting that I was not at that moment searching and roaming around lost. I didn't think I was lost. I thought I knew exactly what my identity was and who I was. And I wasn't looking for anything different. I will just share with you, I say that, and I I, I feel confident in in saying that. However, sometimes I remember, I remind myself that there were two little incidences where I must have been looking for something. Number one, I took up yoga, but I didn't take it up for exercise. I took it up for like breathing and mindfulness and connection. I know that I was looking to connect to something. So it was there. But I got yoga, so I was fulfilled. So again, I felt that I figured it out. I needed to, you know, connect to my chakra or whatever were the things they were telling me. And the other time I recall, um, which, you know, not such a proud moment, but cute nonetheless, I was searching and my cousin came to me, who is Israeli from Aventura originally, and said to me, you know, I heard that there's this group and they're going to this place and they're going with a bunch of Hare Krishnas and they're going to learn how to be mindful and become one with themselves. Do you want to come? And I said, let's do it. So I remember finding myself on a, on a Saturday sitting in a house with a bunch of Hare Krishnas. And if anybody knows what Hare Krishnas do, they, they chant and they blow a lot of smoke. 
like actual physical smoke. And I remember finding myself sitting on the floor with my cousin on a pillow, um, Indian style with tons of smoke. And after about 20 minutes, turning to my cousin and saying, we have to get out of here. I can't breathe. What is this? This isn't for me. And running, literally running out. But I forget about those like funny interest, that funny, interesting moment. But was I, was I, was I a little lost? Well, most definitely. Did I recognize it? I think I'd built so many layers that everything was so great. You know, like we learn in the Tanya, there's this outer shells where you, you build and build and build. I built so many layers, but deep down, I clearly was looking for something. Yeah, it sounds like when this this gentleman, this Jew, yes, said that word to you, are you a Jew, some of those layers stripped off. Yes. I yes. wanted to actually share with you, it made me think of a story coming from the other angle. My grandfather, Rabbi Chaim Gutnick, who was re- um, rabbi in Melbourne, Australia. So there's a story about, I'm just going to say it in one one minute, but there's a story about a girl who came to him and she really wanted to become Jewish and she desperately wanted it. And my grandfather said to her, how about you write down all your feelings, how you feel to the Lubavitcher Rebbe. So she wrote down a letter, poured her heart and soul out as to why she wanted to become Jewish. She sent it to um, to 770, to the Rebbe. And a while later, my grandfather received a letter about something else. And at the bottom of the letter, it said, how is the Jewish girl from Melbourne? So my grandfather went and realized that this girl must be Jewish. And he went to the girl and he said to her, can you go and speak to your parents and see about your family history? She went and spoke to her mother and her mother admitted they're Jewish, that they had changed their identity because they were ashamed of it. And the next time my grandfather went to the Rebbe in Yechidis in New York, um, Yechidis is a private meet audience where you get to talk to the Rebbe alone. Um, he said to the Rebbe, how did you know that this girl was Jewish? And he said to her, with a letter like that, how could you not know? Wow. And this reminds me of your story coming wow. from the other angle that she was searching it and yeah. you weren't searching for it, right. but that a Jew is a Jew. And yeah, like the saying, Neshama was searching. Yeah, the Nesha- her Neshama was yeah. searching for mm-hmm. it. Yet she didn't know her Neshama was searching for it. Right. The other Jew recognized that right. it was, right. like it recognized her. And this is coming from another angle. She was searching for it. Right. But, and she was Jewish. Incredible. Yeah. 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 But what I wanted to ask you is, so fast forward, you went to the Shabbos meal and then here we are today, you're sitting here as a religious woman. Yes. How, did, how did that happen? How did that happen? Um, so I went to that Shabbos meal I experienced it. It was, it was not a monumental, pivotal moment. I'll be honest, it's that particular meal that I was invited to, but it definitely started to lay the groundwork that there was something inside of me that even liked the structure. I, 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 so, you know, we'll talk about at some point my childhood, but there definitely was not structure. And coming from, coming from an upbringing where I didn't have that, I needed it. It's something that I needed for my personality. I probably would say everyone needs it, but I definitely did. And I liked the idea that every Friday night, um, a family would get together and sit together and have a functional, structured meal. Now, obviously, that's very, very surface level. Um, and really what ended up happening is that sparked an interest in me in, in what Shabbos, what Shabbos looks like. When I went back to the the girl, my neighbor, that I mentioned with Shomer Shabbos, and she sort of trained me for a week leading up to the Shabbos meal, I told her, you know, I, I really, this is something that interests me. Can you help me out? She told me, listen, I can't so much, um, but I know someone who can. The people that I go to for Shabbos and the people the, for Shabbat and the people that um, I learn with from time to time, I think they will be very good teachers for you. And she was right. So she sent me to this couple in South Beach, um, and I started spending time in their home. I went to my first Shabbos, my, my first Shabbos meal by them. They had a, they had a Friday night table that would attract somewhere between 15 to 25 singles, and they had many Shadokim at their table as well. Many arranged, not arranged, many matches were made at their table, which was incredible. That was the pivotal moment in my life for sure. I love to tell what it really looked like because it's still so, so vivid in my mind. Um, I, 
she, this girl brought me basically and told me, come, come to their home for the Shabbat meal the following Friday night. And I did, I went, I closed my store early, just like my neighbor, which was a big move. Um, and yeah, it was important to me. It was important to me to experience this. And I remember I drove my car over to her home and I remember what I was wearing, you know, straight from my boutique, definitely not appropriate, but, but, but that's okay. Cause that's who shaped me. Right. And, and shaped me to be a person that definitely doesn't judge when I have those type of people coming in my home, which thank God I do now. And I remember I, I, I walked up these teeny tiny stairs cause they lived in a duplex on the top floor in this cute teeny tiny apartment. And I was coming from a place that Nothing I did was teeny and tiny. Nowhere I went was teeny and tiny. I was literally in mansions on Star Island. So I went up these little stairs to this cute little door. And this woman opens this door. <laughs> and I just remember looking at it, it. I get emotional because it's still till today. It's so profound to me because this is that pivotal moment where she opened the door. And she was one of the most beautiful visions and things I had ever seen. You know, I'll share with you first what she looked like, and then I'll, I'll share with you why this is so profound. If you haven't already imagined, after dressing, you know, Sofia Vergara and the Hiltons, she was with her beautiful, silky hair. I didn't realize it was a shade doll. I just thought she had gorgeous hair at that time. And a long Shabbos robe. Like what a shade doll. Oh, yes. A, a wig. She yeah. was wearing, <laughs> she was wearing a wig. I had no idea. It was just shiny, beautiful black hair <laughs> and a long robe, a velvet black robe. That was what we call a Shabbos robe. It's a very fancy pajama and, and Crocs, like Croc shoes. And I remember. What year was this? Because Crocs went in fashion. <laughs> they were, they were, I don't know if she'll remember, but now? I remember they were green Crocs. <laughs> she'll get a good chuckle if she's listening to this. And. So, you know, breaking this down, first yeah. of all, let me start by saying I was, I was raised and trained to judge a person by how they look. What did that mean? Whoever walked in my store, whoever I bumped into, whoever I was introduced to, I always did a head to toe glance. That is how I judge who you were, who you, who, where you've been, and if I'm going to continue to hang out with you. That's how I learned to judge a person. So I did my typical head to toe and I just shared with you what I got, right? Yeah. All right. And so yet I was like blown away, blown away. This was the most beautiful thing I had ever seen. It absolutely till today really doesn't make sense. I had seen what, what the world, what society and what Hollywood would deem as the most beautiful women on the planet. Now, granted, I wasn't a dummy. So I knew that when these celebrities and socialites were coming in the store, I saw them for who they really were. They were coming in midday, daytime. They hadn't slept all night. They weren't looking as beautiful as the paparazzi was going to make them look that evening. So I knew that. But I also still judged that this was true beauty. Designer labels. Um, just perfection head to toe. So when I looked at this woman and saw this profound beauty in her, I still, like I said, look back till today and think, wow, my neshama, my soul was really, was really getting it. It was finally starting to sort of um, take off those hard layers that I spoke about earlier and sort of let me reconnect back to what really is important. And she opened the door and I walked in and the house smelled fragrant, like the smell of probably chicken and rice, but things that I had not experienced, things I had not smelled. And the table was bustling with people. There were 20 people sitting at a table and there was, there was a baby in a stroller and everyone looked happy and vibrant and talking. No one was worried about if their hair had moved and, you know, what, what shoe they were wearing. That's, no one could see each other's shoes. They were at a Shabbat table. It, it, it was clear to me from like the first four steps that I stepped in this home that I wanted this lifestyle. I didn't understand what it was, but I knew that this is what I wanted. And that was my pivotal moment. Did you feel like you had to walk away from your previous life or just change your perception of it? So how did your your view of vanity and um, 
physical beauty, what you see. How did well, that change? Right. Such a journey. I, I'll tell you, I initially thought I had to walk away. And in many ways, I did. I kept my store um, for, for four years from the day I became from. I was married shortly after I was married, five months after I decided to become a religious girl. But I kept my store for four years. You were I, married five months after you became religious? Yes. Wow. I started becoming religious, very little slow steps, sort of. Slow steps for keeping kosher and slow steps for keeping keeping the Sabbath. But um, as far as dressing modestly, that I did overnight. And I would love to talk about that if we have a moment, because we'll get to that, you know, when you're ready, because that's something that I think also people are very interested in. Yeah. Like, yeah. how did Usually you do that overnight? That's like the hardest thing to do. So I definitely want to talk about that. But, um, but before we get to that, um, so I had kept my store for four years. Two, it was definitely in two stages, and I'm probably in another stage right now. The first stage was, I have completely changed my life and I've turned my life around. All the people I knew, I cut them off. Um, my clients I kept, but they saw that I looked different. I think that's in one way why I made that change so quickly. I wanted them to see. That you made a change. That I had made a change. Yeah. And um, They commented? Yes. Yes. Like, what would they say? I'll share with you. I have a very good customer, a client, uh, that her and her sister were are still famous Mexican singers. They won Billboard Awards. Very, very famous. Are you allowed to share names? Yes, for sure. The name of the band was is Los Horoscopos de Durango. I'm proud that I could say that well. (laughs) Los Horoscopos de Durango. (laughs) And the name of the sisters are Vicky, uh, Vicky Terrazas, and her sister, her sister's first name is Marisol. And I was their personal stylist and their personal shopper. Um, I would also do backstage with them, where I would kind of, they had their own backstage people, but we were friendly. We were very good friends. She wanted me there, and I was, you know, fixed her and got her ready before she went back on stage. Um, at some point, I had already become from. I was religious. I was married. I was wearing a shade to wig. And they come to visit their usual, they came twice a year to shop with me. They would spend about twenty to 30000 each sitting. And they would sort of get their wardrobe for the next six months. And they came and her sister tells me, actually crying, my, my hairstylist bleached my hair and burned my hair. She was wearing a hat. She walks in my boutique wearing a hat and says to me, I burned my hair. She burned my hair. What am, I don't know what to do. I'm in tears. And she said, I have an appointment to go put in extensions tonight. And it was one of the first times I was not scared and proud enough to tell a customer that I was wearing a wig because I knew these were my these were my clients and they were important to me that they would still feel and look beautiful so I said to her I have to let you in on a secret I'm wearing a wig and I have a lady who's in Bell Harbor who sells wigs and you this doesn't need to be so difficult so painful let's take you to her Buy a few wigs and you'll put them on. And she was like, a wig? And she's, you know, to them, a wig was like something you see like in the flea market. And she's looking at me and she goes, I can't believe you're wearing a wig. And that was at the time before lace fronts. Imagine, (laughs) you know, I don't even know if there was baby hair yet. I think you blow dried it for like 20 minutes on really high heat to get the poop. How many years ago was this? 15 years. Right. This is 15 years ago. Am I right? I don't, I mean, if yeah, there yeah. was lace front, there might no, have no, been. No, no, there was, there was not. And I, I don't <laughs> it remember. Good. No yeah. one, and it wasn't good. And nobody had, um, nobody had introduced me to baby hair yet. There might have been. So I took her to Yaffa in, in Bell Harbor. She opened her, she kept her store open. We came in the night. She didn't want anybody to see. And she bought two wigs and she wore them for many, many months until her hair sort of grew back. So I don't know. It's just a cute story right. that I had finally learned to accept and be proud that I was doing these very interesting things that maybe my customers... Ha- ha- not maybe. I believe Hashem gave you the opportunity yes. to embrace that yes. through her sharing this to you. Yes. You know? Yes. Yeah. And so I kept... So I, I want to go back to even yeah. your question and me telling you that there were different stages. So to reiterate, stage one was me saying, I don't have anything to do with any of this, but sort of keeping my store, hanging in the mix, kind of winking it, 
putting on a facade and sort of winging it. I remember going, I need to continue to make money. And, you know, there was a part of me that very much loved what I did. There was an expression I used to tell my husband, the store is my life. And I said that expression for many, many, many years. I am going to divert and tell you something, again, pivotal that happened to me. For many years, I told my husband, this is my life. And I had our first baby, a second baby 11 months later, and a third baby 13 months after that. I was the girl that had the three under three. I actually had four under four. Um, Did when you have three girls first? No, boy, uh-huh. a girl, and a girl. Right. I and also had three under three. Yeah. So I, so I yeah, actually I had, yeah. Yeah, so I had four under four. Why? Yeah. I, I mentioned the first week. So came right. time that I was pregnant with my fourth. I was due to give birth end of the summer. And my husband and I went to Orlando, a little family vacation. And we, I had this expression, like I said. And my expression would be, he, well, this is how it would go. My husband would say something like, I think it's time for you to close the store. And I would every time, without a doubt, respond, the store is my life. Don't do that to me. Every single time. We were on our way home from Orlando. I was with a big belly like this, um, about to give birth to our fourth child with three babies under three sitting in the back seat. And it was late at night because we had done that thing where we left Legoland late. So the kids would sleep on the way home. And my husband turns to me and says to me again, for like the hundredth time, you know, you're going to have another, you're going to have our, our, another baby now, our, our fourth child. I really think it's time for you to consider closing the store. <laughs> and I turned to my husband and I remember saying to him, like I always did, but the store is my life. Pesach, how can you expect for me to give up my life? This is who I am. And my husband said to me for the first time, at least that I remember, because it was, it's what jolted me. No, look in the rearview mirror. That's your life. It hit me finally. Now, granted, maybe I, I was pregnant with my fourth. I was tired. Business wasn't as good as it had been. And it wasn't. But it finally hit me. It finally, I finally understood. Probably, you know, that was one of the first times that I really got in touch with my identity, my true identity. Bring this back, you know, to your first question. Not your first question, I'm sorry, your initial question. How did, like, was it just like I walked away? So why do I say it was st- steps? Because at first I did walk away, but I walked away for the things that were convenient for me the things that were easy for me. It's very easy to leave a bunch of people who don't eat kosher and who go out till midnight because anyways, five months later, I was married. And again, we'll talk about it. It was easy for me to change my clothes because I was proud and I wanted, I wanted, I wanted God. I wanted Hashem to be proud of me. But other things that were not easy for me, like my store, like making that my priority, like running to go meet a client in a hotel and leaving the baby with um, the babysitter, you know, at some strange hour of the day, even though maybe my baby needed me or maybe not. There's nothing wrong with, you know, having a babysitter. I do it now. But my priority, where my priorities lay, were not necessarily raising a family. Maybe not necessarily even building a Jewish home yet. And so that was stage one. And then stage two came where... I, Which is interesting. I just want to note that those are things that you can do as a religious woman. Yes. So it's not even like you had to let them go. I didn't, but I didn't right. know that. But right, right. Right. Maybe it was because of your mindset. Perhaps. And also, you, you know, know, you hadn't legit had a balance. I had too. not learned to balance. And the couple that made, you know, the couple that made me from, the makar of me, that made me religious, right? That's what makar means to bring you, really translates it as to bring you closer to God. But that couple, that's not necessarily... That's not necessarily what they were focused on with me at that time yet. What do you mean they weren't? That wasn't. Finding a healthy balance. Oh. And that's okay. Yeah. Because at that time, I was so excited and sort of, what is that expression, gung-ho, to become a religious girl. And they saw that. So they capitalized on that. And that's how I moved forward and moved forward and moved forward. I don't know if somebody had told me at that time, whoa, 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 you could balance. I'm not that girl. I don't know if I would have got the memo. So the second step, second stage was sort of a fun, an interesting stage where I was like, wait a minute. 
I threw away all my designer stuff and I ran to, you know, I mean, really, I actually did this, you know, I ran to a store that, you know, I was wearing things, perhaps, let's talk about the garments, that I didn't necessarily feel beautiful in or feel proud about, but it was like, oh, that's what I'm supposed to do. So I'm going to do that. And it might seem silly or awkward, but for a girl whose entire uh, 20-year-old lifespan was about clothing and fashion, that was a very important segment where I was like trying to figure out. So all of a sudden, it was sort of like, I don't even like the way I look. I don't like the way I dress. I don't, why did I, wait, and then no one wants to build resentment towards Judaism or modesty in that way. So that, I mean, you were liking dressing in the religious. Yes, because I I didn't understand that I could like, make it look, make it look cool. Yeah. I went from one extreme to to the the other. other. So then all of a sudden I started sort of playing around and looking into, hold on a second. Like, I'll give you an example of what was like very not cool. My, my, my boutique specialized in corsets. Um, like custom corsets. That's what we made for celebrities. And I didn't want to give them up. So I went and I bought, I don't know if you guys remember, there was like the Kiki Riki. It was this yeah. really tight fitted yeah, shirt yeah, and it came in 35 colors, <laughs> four shades of blue, four shades of green, four shades of pink. So I went and bought every single <laughs> one, every single shade of blue. Why? Because I had like a baby blue corset and a midnight blue corset right. and, you know, a, a, a pale pink corset. So I would wear a Kiki Riki underneath my corsets so that I wouldn't give them up. Right. But I, I mean, I, I... By the way, Kiki, for anyone listening who doesn't know what Kiki Riki is, it's these long sleeve tops. Like yeah, it's yeah. a long yeah. shell. Underneath sleeveless dresses. Yes. 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 <laughs> and it was very in at the time and they yes. were very handy and helpful yeah. for things that were possibly like sheer, but I wasn't using them for that. Oh no. I was taking the clothing that I should not have been wearing anymore and putting these things underneath and 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 actually leaving the house thinking that no one could tell that this thing didn't have sleeves. Anyways, cute little thing, but like I just I hadn't figured out a balance. And now I, you know, just to, to, to wrap up that, that answer comes now, you know, 15 years later, I have definitely, definitely learned and figured out a balance. Now, how did I learn it? And when did it really start changing for me? I really want to share this. It was through learning starting about five years ago, the Lubavitcher Rebbe's Sichas, his talks. So how did that happen? What does that even mean? So about five years ago, I took on a class that a very good friend of mine arranges. I could give this plug. Uh, Etty Schwartz, who's here on on um, Shluchis, on a campus, serving as the, the Rebbitz and the rabbi, her and her husband on campus for um, Nova University in Davie, decided also about five years ago, I hope I'm getting the, the year right, had a very pivotal moment in her life where she decided that she's going to learn weekly the talks of the Rebbe. And she started this this class over the phone. I took on that I was going to listen to it. Of course, I had been learning up till that point, but I don't think I was diving in to these very deep Hasidic thoughts, the way that she introduced them to me. And so I started learning them. And one of the biggest messages I started to get out of them, scattered throughout, there are many messages, and, and through today, is that... Our mission here is to elevate and beautify everything. I remember the first time I heard it and I went, whoa, okay, hold on a second. This is not just food and drink. This is not just through a mitzvah, through a good deed. Because some things I connect to and some things I don't, right? We're all like that. But I connect to clothing. I connect to garments. And I remember taking, listening to a particular talk that was talking about beautiful things. Afrida Karebi, the previous Rebbe before our Rebbe, talked about beautiful things and how we can elevate them. And that really hit home. Because all of a sudden it meant that my my the clothing I want to wear, the beautiful clothing I want to wear, the beautiful shoes I want to buy that are maybe on the pricier side, if I look at them as something that is elevating me, which I have this really cool, I think it's very cool, thing that I've developed over the years in this five, six, well, it's probably started even before that, but it really got stronger when I started learning the Rebbe's talks, is that 
the more um, higher end things that I buy and the things that I, I really, really love, I find my evil inclination and I keep them only for, for Shabbat for the Yom Tovs, for the holidays, and for special occasions. They are separated in my closet. I do not, that I actually had started from even before this particular thing. I do not wear the same garments weekday and the Sabbath. I, I don't. I have two completely separate wardrobes and my more beautiful things are the things I spent more my hard earned money on. I keep them for the Sabbath. And that's like one of the ways that I elevate and beautify you know, call it the material, the gashmiistic things around me, those material things. So that's my healthy balance. It's still a work in progress. This is a long, a long answer to a very short question, but it is a work in progress. And I'm, I'm, I'm learning and I'm, I'm growing in that way of that healthy balance. In what sense is it a work in progress? Because it sounds to me that that is such a, such a great way to find balance. You, you don't really have to give up the things you love. You have to, you can find a way to elevate it. Yes. And so... What, what would be a goal? Like, meaning, what, what are you looking okay, for? Okay, so I think my goal would be to keep it. Okay. To make sure that... So that's a part of you. Yeah. It's a really a part of me, but also that I stay true to it. Right. Because... Well, that I, would be... I'm, be that's anybody's, right? Yeah. And also, I'm, I'm tempted often. Right. Be, so what would you be tempted... I'm saying, what would I'll you tell you. Yeah. I'll tell you. I'll tell you. I will share with you, ladies. Okay. <laughs> it happens to me so much and more and more recent, and I'm struggling with it. I think it was much easier like five years ago, seven, eight years ago, even the keeping the clothes separated. Because to be honest, like when I became religious, at least the circle that I was in, they were not buying Chanel. <laughs> Just like, I'm being honest. You mean the religious circle. The religious yeah. circle I'm in, they right. were not. Right. And I have seen, and I, I, I can say this, right? I'll be mm-hmm. very honest. Yeah. And I, again, no judgment. I have seen a major shift. I'm very sensitive to it. You may I have seen a shift that people do buy brand names. Not only are they buying brand names, it's becoming very, very important to them. To the people that are in my circle, it's right. becoming very important to them. Almost to a, to a to a point, I don't want to use the term to a flaw, because that's not me to judge. But to a point that it's like so important, they're prioritizing it. Now, they maybe like you, they like those nice things. Yes, but I speak with these women. Right. Because I'm curious, because I speak about it. I speak to high schools about it and seminary girls about it. We all, the, so there's, important. It's a very yeah. important message. So I talk to my friends and they tell me, well, I live in an area where everybody, where a lot of the majority of my community are wearing, you know, this particular purse or this particular brand. I have to have it. They feel the pressure. And I think that that's very interesting. Yeah, well, you have to kind of ask yourself, is it because I feel the pressure yes. or is it because I actually those those expensive things yes. are made very well? Yes. And they are nice and I feel good wearing no, them. It sounds like what you're saying is it's the new keeping up with the Joneses. Right. It's like yes. everyone around them is doing it. So there's this. Right. So there's that. Pressure. But I'm saying there is also that it is actually a nice item of clothing. And I agree. And I agree. And, I agree. And, I'm very, yeah, right. and I'm very into quality. Yeah. And I'm very into I am. I am still into beautiful designer things. So I guess what, what I'm trying to say is, because you asked me, right. what is it? Where, what's my goal? So my goal would be to not forget why I'm buying these beautiful right. things, to to keep in touch with what really is my mission, what's my purpose here when I'm buying that beautiful thing, what is my purpose, and to do self checks. I'm very into self checks. Am I buying it because I feel like I need to have it? I just went to a wedding. Everyone was in Gucci. I wasn't, and I feel like a little bit of a nerd. Because that has happened to me. I will be honest. It has recently happened to me. And I'm almost fascinated by it. Because like out of all things, that's what should make me feel like a nerd. <laughs> I'm using the word nerd. I don't know a better word. But but it did. It did. For whatever reason, you know, listen, I, I had a baby five months ago. Um, maybe my self-esteem is not on par with where it should be. Which leads into... That's an- what I'm saying. It might not be the Gucci dress. Yeah. It might it's be the, the self-esteem. Not in- which leads into another part what, where where when I'm doing these self-checks, I go, whoa, 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 Rachel, take a step back. This may not be about the Gucci shoes. This might be about how I'm feeling about myself right now. Right. Hmm, okay. My self-esteem isn't feeling so great. Why is that? 
What, what makes me feel good? So I'm, I've tapped and I know how I feel good. I know where my self esteem is, is feeling stronger. It's when I'm working out and sweating. That makes me feel good. It's when I'm learning and I'm doing the proper learning. It's, these are the things that, that sort of keep me going. It's when I'm, when I'm, you know, in line with my Tehillim during the day. I'm focused on that. Those things keep me going with good self esteem. So, Again, self checks and, and all those three, three things do it for me too. Really, working out, learning something, saying to Hillary. Yeah, yeah, this is this is a, a very <laughs> crucial message yeah. and also very empowering. That if, if anyone, and I'm I'm sure there's so many people listening who can relate to this, is that if if, if you're feeling that feeling, if you're living in a community where there's a certain you know thing you have to do to keep up, and there's that feeling of having to get it, otherwise you're you feel like a nerd. Let's say, is that you? It's usually a symptom. It's a symptom. It's okay. Like it, you can experience that feeling, but dig a little deeper. Like what's going on? Yeah. What's like it going may on? not. It might not be the keeping up with the Joneses. Right. It might not be. Right. It might not be. But it's it might, why it might might not. Why not? Explore. Yeah. And two things or, on that. Exactly. The first is, you know, I'm I'm talking obviously about fashion and garments because that's something I'm very prone right. to. But houses, there's a whole. I'm sure we can all agree. There is, listen, the world is moving and things are becoming more modern and it's becoming easier to build a bigger home. It's not what it was 20 years ago. That's my husband's business. I see it. It's much easier to fabricate material and make a bigger home and it's more accessible. But there's this, there's this, there's this keeping up with the Jones mentality needs to be bigger. It needs to be, you know, again, I remember doing a talk of the Rebbe that he spoke about particularly this thing. Fascinating that he was so, that the Lubavitcher Rebbe was so ahead of his time that he even talks about, um, this idea, this novel idea that you shouldn't look to your neighbors right. left and right. Work on yourself. Look, look in your own home. There is something so beautiful about having a beautiful home. I'm very fortunate to have one, but I know it makes me feel good. It makes me feel connected to God. It makes Shabbos, the Shabbat feel special. It makes me feel calm so I take care of my kids better. We have to tap within ourselves right. why we want these things. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. And, I, and to add to that time. about and the concept of people who are dating because that's the field that I'm in right now, matchmaking, I, I was just thinking this yesterday is that it, it became a little bit more of a superficial world because of social media and all the dating apps. And so we're looking at a picture. But I was thinking to share with singles to ask themselves not about, not yes, you need to be attracted to the person. There has to be a physical attraction. But how do you want to live in your home? Like, what do you, how, what, what what's your expectation? Home, what is your expectation of the kind of home you want people to walk into? Yes. How do people, how do you want people to feel when they come in? What kind of experiences do you want to create? So it's in line with what yeah. you're sharing, yeah. you know, and that you started to think about what it is in your home that you want to create. Yes. Yeah, definitely. But so on, on going back to not the home, but you were just, we were just talking about clothing and um, having babies and um, the <laughs> stages that you're at, et cetera. So you're sitting here five months after you, five months? Yeah, five months. Just five months five after months you had a baby. That's not, yes. <laughs> so how do you feel? Like, first of all, just so everybody knows, this is our first time that, um, the interview is very spontaneous. Like we did not prepare the questions before. So let us know how you feel about that. <laughs> and so you weren't, you, you've done this spontaneously. It's kind of the same way you left the store. Um, you closed up the shop spontaneously. Yes. Like, this is what I want to do. So you're a spontaneous kind of person. You've come here in today. Something. In something. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't send you questions before. You're here right here five months after you've had a baby. Yeah. How were you feeling coming here and sitting here if you're sharing that you were sharing before, like you're not necessarily in right. the exact place that you want to be. Right. So, so, right. So that's, yeah, I, I would, I would say I, I it took me a second. I, I read Edith's text <laughs> <laughs> and I thought the first thing I thought was, okay, if there's going to be cameras, I'm going to be, you know, 20 pounds overweight than what I'd like to be. That's the first thing I thought. And then I took a deep breath on that because it's my seventh, thank God. And I've learned that, you know, it takes time to get back to yourself physically. Um, and then I was thinking like, you know, okay, I'm not going to, you know, I've gone, I've spoken for people where I was really prepared and I've spoken for people where I had a week to prepare and then something like today, really last minute. And the truth is that like, you know, sharing sometimes spontaneity <laughs> could be a good thing because you really bring out of you, um, the truth, it comes out. I turned to my husband and I said to him, um, Pesach, you know, Edith Shatzen just texted me and she's asking me if I could 
you know, speak for them for their podcast. And what do you think? And he says to me, well, when would it be? And I said, it would be like tomorrow. tomorrow. And he says, um, he says, well, that's good. At least, you know what? You won't get nervous because, you know, and I said, oh, but I wish I had like five months. You know, I would be more of who I think I really am. I don't even know what that means. And my husband said, yeah, but you'd have five months to be nervous. Just go. What are you doing tomorrow anyways? So <laughs> the point is that, you know, sometimes the best, the best comes out of us when, when we're sort of just put in that position and we have to sort of make it work and make it happen. Yeah. And, and that's think, my whole life, by the way. Right. I think looking back, it's definitely. And that's, that's for a me. very powerful message because there's, when are we ever ready, fully ready for anything? And a right? lot of people on their journeys through life and having babies feel like they're not at the right weight to be doing something or they're not, they're not the best version of themselves just yet. But to tap into that place of Hashem presents things to us when they're meant to happen. Yes. Like if you feel that you can do this and you have something to offer, take it up because this is the time when you're meant to do it. And there's that concept that God doesn't give us anything we can't handle. It's, it's very, it might be harder to really resonate within yourself. Yeah, it's a hard thing. It's a hard you thing. you want to but, feel your best self when you're doing right, something. But it is really true. I look back on the things that I went through. God... Hashem did not give me anything I couldn't handle. And if anything, the truth is that now um, a, hard things are a lot easier for me. A lot, you know, my father just passed away. And it was in just... uh My father passed away the night of our son's bar mitzvah, wow. <laughs> which is pretty, yeah, oh my gosh, <laughs> pretty so intense. Sorry. Now, he was sick leading up to it, and I made a bas mitzvah. And then a three weeks later, because like I said, our children are 11 months apart, 11 months and a week apart, three weeks oh, later, wow. we made a bar mitzvah. And I'd been taking care of my father for over two years, and he passed away the night of the bar mitzvah. A lot of people perhaps would have viewed me at that moment, the moments post, post, um, his passing and thought maybe or said to me things like, are you handling this well? You're not so emotional or why aren't you falling apart? Or, and don't get me wrong. I cry daily, daily, once a day. I get it in, but I was handling it well because first of all, I've been through so much in my childhood. And I know that God is making everything happen the way it's meant to be. There's this really, um, there's this really beautiful quote that says, um, there, there are no, there are no places that lead you nowhere. Nowhere's in capital letters when you read this quote. There's no places that lead you nowhere. Everywhere you're going is meant to be for you to go there. That there is no nowhere. What is that even term nowhere? So it's, it's very, it's very much something that resonates with me and I keep with me. Um, and my father himself was not that kind of guy. He was a very, very proud that I had become religious and very, um, adamant that I had made this life based on, on God and putting me exactly where I was meant to be. And I better stop complaining about bad things that happened to me because you can't complain when things are bad and not, and then when everything is good, say, oh yeah, well, that's, that's what it means to be religious. Things should be great. My, my marriage should be great. My home should be great. My, cause things can be great, but sometimes they're not. And the good and the bad come with that package deal. If God's in charge, he's in charge. Bad things can happen. So it might sound a little harsh and I don't mean it to be, but it's your father's way of of communicating to you that they can you can have those mixed good bad together I mean, my that's... my rabbi rabbi lieberman always tells me being jewish judaism is schizophrenic <laughs> i love when he tells me that i he probably has to tell it to me once a year and he did tell it to me the morning that we needed to make the burial the leviah for my father because i said it was it was it was Hours before we were going into um, the holiday of Sukkot, hours, that's my father passed away on the night of, uh, the night of what we call Erev Sukkot, the day before. And I said, Rabbi, how am I supposed to go bury my father today? You're telling me to go into a holiday with joy and simcha? Joyous? And I'm burying my father. And he said, oh, that's Judaism. That's being religious. It's called being schiz. You're gonna, you're gonna be schizophrenic. Right. You're gonna be happy and sad at the same exact time because 
that's how God rules. That's how God wants it for me. Yeah, you had the bar mitzvah, which is you're celebrating life. Your father passed away. Then you're going into sukkahs. Right into sukkahs. It's hours later. Says. And that's why we break the glass before a wedding. Yes. Because we're celebrating it, but we're also recognizing the pain that the world people in the world are experiencing. Right. And that's actually, I was just at a wedding. That's exactly what it is. It's in the same second, the same moment. How incredible is a Torah way of life right. that you're even able to, we're actually able to do it. Right. And we do. Do you know that we just interviewed Sapir Cohen? She was a hostage in um, Gaza, that, and we just interviewed her in Arizona. And there was a group, they've also brought out a group of soldiers that were in Gaza, and they were the musicians. And they were, they were singing, and you could see the pain in their eyes. And we brought Sapir in, who was a miracle that was released from Gaza, and we're dancing with her. And it was one of those moments where you felt like the pain, you saw the pain of the soldiers, and you felt the miracle of Sapir being released, like well, holding space for the, both that right? pain and the joy. Right. I want to take us back to this um, moment. We, by the way, you gave us a, the 10, 15 oh, minute countdown. Okay. So time is flying. Yes. But, um, time okay. is flying. So I want to go back a little bit because we talked about your journey toward, Judea, toward in, Ju in Judaism becoming religious. And um, then we talked about sort of another journey of, of prioritizing, finding your priorities. And you said that your husband... You know, when, when you talked about the store and that how that like sort of conflicted with your family life and you had to make that decision to to close that store. So can you tell us about when you made the decision? Like, what was that moment when you made it? Because I think a lot of women or people, I should say, are are pulled in, I'm for sure, pulled in many different directions, always trying to prioritize, do what we love, but also have, you know, what we are, our family life and just find direction. But what you said really resonated. It's like, you know, what is my life? Is my life what I'm doing? Is my life me as a mother? So what, like that moment when you decided to close the store, what was your decision making? Um, what was the decision point for you? So I think, I think, I think I know I can answer that, but I think I, what I want to, to just touch on as I'm answering it is I think it's a question of priorities. I knew at that moment that that was the right thing to do. I wasn't able to be present for my children. I had, I had babies. I was going to have a fourth baby under four. So, and, and particularly, I want to say retail itself, particularly retail is very, uh, time consuming because you have to be there present. It's not a job that you, you know, you do an hour a day or four hours a day. You're actually doing it like nine to 10 hours a day, but, you know, because I had to be in the store. I was the lifeline of the store. Um, so definitely I needed to, I, I remember saying to myself, okay, my identity is not the woman who owns a store. I needed to sort of like take a step back and realize I had this beautiful family. My husband very, very much helped me do that. And that I'm very grateful for that as well as the Torah, many concepts in the Torah. Um, and I slowly started tapping into what that looks like because I probably wasn't the most present mother and I didn't have to be yet. They were babies. As the kids got, got older, I learned to be more present. A lot of parenting classes, a lot of <laughs> deselfishing myself. My nature was to be very selfish. I hate, you know, may not sound great well, on mic. But that was my nature, and that came from my upbringing, having been raised an only child, um, with, you know, with a single mother, who that was her nature, that was her mother's nature, my grandmother, and that was her mother's nature, my great grandmother. They were all raised to care only about themselves, and by the time it got down to me, selfish was was the way of life. So even becoming married, you sort of have to de, de selfish. Yeah. I'm, I'm I'm penning my own, my own my own term. <laughs> yes, yeah. I'm penning my own term. I was <laughs> selfish about everything, and I was I was. Um, my husband says I wouldn't even share the food on my plate. <laughs> I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I you wouldn't. I was hungry, <laughs> but he would say like, "Oh, could I try that?" And I would say, "I don't. I don't think so. Order your own." <laughs> like you know. So it, it took me quite a. It took me about a year to learn to share the food on my plate. That's my my husband's favorite one to share. But but really, but but you know, but yeah. everything. So so. I had to learn to, I had to really learn that this is not about me anymore. 
as well as, again, uh, that's why I say work in progress, grow and learn towards making a healthy balance where, yes, my kids prioritize. My kids and my husband have to come first. I now recognize that. I've learned that through learning the Rebbe's talks about learning chassidus, chassidut, on a daily basis. I'm not learning weekly. I'm learning it daily. It's my lifeline. I need it. Do you have a favorite source like, for learning? Like, so this, this Sikha that I told you, which is um, it's actually given by a woman in LA, Fruma Shapiro, Rebetzin Fruma Shapiro. She's Rabbi Gordon's niece. Okay. She's phenomenal. Shays Taub is a big go-to for me. Um, I really like him for parenting. There's another rabbi on Chabad.org that I really like, Rabbi New. That's my uncle. Oh, nice. Yeah. Which, rabbi Moshe New? Yes. In, in Montreal? Yes. So yes. I have heard all of his <laughs> classes, especially yes. for Yom Tov. He, he gives my mom remember really well. Yeah. I've, I've pretty much listened to everything he's given yeah. over he's like amazing. four we, we times. To you again. <laughs> yeah. I've done it at least four times. Okay. I do a lot of repeat because if it resonates with me, I need the reminder. Yeah. I can't do it once. Yeah. That doesn't work for yeah. me. I don't know if it What do right. you learn from my uncle? Which classes do you listen I've to? done all of them. I've done everything. I've done all like on the Yom Tovim. He has like four classes on Rosh Hashanah. I'll do four. But, like I've done them all. Um, she, like I said, Chase Tab, I love for parenting. There's another rabbi for parenting I really like. Um, and again, all, all the sikhas, all the talks of the Rebbe, every single one, you can extract from it exactly what you need that week. So um, I, I wanted to just ask yeah. you, so you, yeah, you, I guess you're a, a very passionate, like a more of an extreme kind of person. You had to kind of let go of work in order to embrace your family. At now, that time. At that time. Now yes. when you have a balance, what do you do? Do you work now? Yes, I do. Okay. I work and I, I do so many things. And What, what do you do? And I'll tell you. And also okay. I just want to mention when I tell them to you, <laughs> what is the key to them is I I'm learning not to make them my priority. So what do I do? So I do interior design. I... I have a client that I kept from my store all these years that they wouldn't let me quit. So I do custom clothing for them year round, probably make about like 10 outfits for her a year. And I personal shop for her as well. So wherever I go and I see like the matching handbags and the shoes, I purchase them to match the custom outfits I'm going to make. So I still do that. Um, and then, like I said, I do interior design. I run women's programming for my synagogue. I Your do synagogue is weird. Chabad of Inverary. I do speaking engagements, which I get to try travel recent like two three times a year out of florida so that's pretty pretty amazing because i get to go i just came from milwaukee so that was really good from wisconsin it was very cool um so i i do work and i and i just had a baby (laughs) but what i'm learning is to prioritize i'm i'm really learning not only to prioritize but something else i'm learning now is my oldest our oldest daughter is 12 we have a son um, that's 13 above her. And so we have a 13, a 12, an 11 year old, an almost 10 year old. So one thing I'm learning is to incorporate like my work for synagogue. Like I'll make beautiful baskets for, for, um, families that are moving in and I'll do women's programming. So what I've learned to do is, is get my daughters involved. I think that's really important. I think I'm going out as an emissary of the Rebbe Shlokas, being like, like going out, you know, f- to going out to to these incredible places or even big cities to represent Chabad, running a Chabad house is very, very unique, but very, very special because it, it teaches you to not be selfish. Right. It's not about you. And is I that want- recent that you just went on Shulchas? No, I'm not on Shulchas. Oh. I just am doing the programming for my synagogue for um, oh, you, the synagogue seven you years. Yeah. 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 Like the Rebbe said, unfortunately. You have more going on yeah, now than that's you what I'm going to say. Since, you, oh. had, since yeah. you put your priorities in check, it sounds like you've got more going on than you had in the shop. <laughs> right. I definitely do. But yeah. it's beautiful things that are about elevating right. and I'm teaching, meaningful, te- meaningful, and also teaching valuable lessons. So, like I was saying, my, my girls come with me, they deliver baskets with me, they set up the table. You know, recently right. my, my daughter and I, I have a lot of things from doing events for people. I also do a lot of, like, I help my friends do bas mitzvahs and things on low budget. Anyways, wow. I, my daughter, who is in her bas mitzvah year, there was a girl in her class that, from my understanding, wasn't going to have a, a large bas mitzvah, which is the, where, you know, I'm sure, I don't know if you're, you're, your viewers know, but it's when a girl becomes 12, it's a very big milestone for us in Judaism. And so I got word of this. Somebody, their rabbit's in, the, ra- the wife of the rabbi t- called me to tell me, I heard you have tablecloths. I said to her, what is this for? She told me, I said, listen, do you need somebody to make this bas mitzvah? 
beautiful? And she said, yes. So I made floral arrangements. I am not a florist. I think they looked very, I don't know if they looked good, <laughs> but uh, whatever. I stuck va- uh, flowers in a vase and tried to make them pretty. And I had my daughter do it with me. And then I got three of her friends on board because I told their, their, those mothers, um, w- would you let your daughter come with me early to set up? And we did. Me, my daughter, and three of her friends set up this entire bas mitzvah, the tablecloth, the vases. I donated the flowers. We did the plates. The girls did everything. And they set up for this girl in her class. And it was it was such a great, like, nachas so nice. moment for wow. me because I gave this girl a pretty room. And I felt like, wow, you know, this is what using your talent is about. Yeah. And I had my daughter do it. So I really try to, like infuse this I in really my children feel that when you decided to prioritize your family Hashem gave you opportunities in your work to bring yes your family definitely in. definitely recently I made dresses for a friend who was having a bar mitzvah um it was such a fulfilling thing for me to do I tried to explain it to her she's not gonna understand like I'm like do you understand what you did for me you let me take my talent that God gave me and make beautiful modest clothes for you we made three dresses so that she would have what to choose from which that in itself was fun and it was it was such a fulfilling thing for me and when I showed up to the bus mitzvah as a guest she looked beautiful she felt beautiful she was dressed modestly in this gorgeous custom dress and she told me thank you because the last par mitzvah i didn't feel pretty and and she, and, and it was so again i'm i'm god is also giving me the energy <laughs> to do these things and it's it's definitely fulfilling and hashem should also give you strength for the loss of your father thank you him. amen and and you you look beautiful today i'm thank so you. blown away that you came here 5 months after you've had a baby even though you don't feel ready but I'm happy to be I on a chair, <laughs> not you standing. Feel, you feel that you're ready. <laughs> like you, you send the message of do it before you're ready. Because yeah. when do we ever feel fully ready? Right, right. Yeah. We don't. We don't. <laughs> and I think we have to just put ourselves out there and not a, not be afraid to fail. And and I think one of my biggest messages would be and not be afraid of what people think. Right. Because going back to like self-esteem and that I wasn't, I, I didn't grow up being taught the concept of self-esteem, I think that played a lot into like my journey and who I became. I became the girl that was like hiding behind all those pretty things because really deep down, I didn't have, I didn't have a self-esteem, but I didn't have a real foundation and I didn't have, I wasn't, I wasn't, I wasn't in tune with the relationship that I could have had with God. Once I made that relationship with God and I tapped into it and I started flourishing it, through my learning and through changing the way I dressed and the way I ate and the way I walked, I started like building this relationship with God. I think. And you also transformed yourself. I mean, you yeah. To change. You change how you grew up, you change. I think it's a really important message. I, 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 you know, I'm sure at some point we're, we're running out of time, but I want to give over that message because this applies to all types of women, men, children, everyone. You know, building a relationship with God, I think that's the priority. That should come first. And then, the priorities. and then the priorities continue because we learn marriage is with God. There are three of us. But I want to work first on my on my relationship with God. I want to make him proud. I want to become a better davener, prayer. I want to become a better mother. But I want to do, do those things to make Hashem proud and to make the Lubavitcher Rebbe proud. But he's my he's my messenger, right, to God. So it's all about that relationship. And I think that is what instills confidence, better marriage, better mothering, better Balance. everything, right? Yeah. It's it's really all about that relationship. Right. That should be the start of the focus. Yeah. And then when you find, when you work on those priorities, then the other stuff will generally fall into place. Definitely. Yeah. And even if they're not, you'll have the strength right. and the confidence to figure them out and make them work. Even if it takes time. Even if it takes time. And it does. We usually end our podcast with a favorite quote. But because we did this spontaneously, maybe we'll share one first and then and then you can share one too. Okay. You want to go first? Okay, I will. <laughs> um, we w- I actually did this um, course recently and Ida did it as, co- as well since you've been speaking about the Rebbe. It's called The Rebbe's Advice for Life. It's a JLI course. Yes. And um, just I was just listening and watching lesson five. And um, I think this is very applicable. You know, sometimes you look, 
or you always learn something and it applies to what's going on in your yeah, day. Definitely. And the Rebbe says, wherever a Jew may find themselves, they were sent there by God on admission to bring the light of Judaism to that place. Beautiful. And that makes me think of you and what you're sharing. Thank you. That's beautiful. Okay. I thought of one. Um, it's sort of related. It's about Hashem and, and really looking to Hashem. And I hope I don't butcher this, but the, a person says, Hashem, I can't, their life is so hard. Hashem, I can't do this anymore. I'm so overwhelmed. And then Hashem responds with, great, now I can do my job, meaning surrender. And now I, now I can do what I was supposed to do so that you can take me into your life. And uh, I think that I, by, I mean, that is, it does have to do everything with me. I experienced that. I'm just telling you, I, I had a moment where I looked in the mirror and I remember it and I was 16 and I said, I cannot do this anymore. I had a very difficult childhood. I don't want to live like this anymore. I can't do this. And I think that things started to change for me. God must have heard me and said, okay, I will help this girl. I will carry her. It took time, nine years, but he, he took me on that journey, the next you know part of my life. Wow. So it very much has to do with me. So thank you for that, because I, I don't, I've never heard that before, and it's really beautiful. Um, I guess I'll, I'll reshare, because I shared it earlier, but I really like this quote, where we say that there is nowhere, there are no places that take you nowhere. Um, the bottom line for me is, I went through a lot, and some things I am not proud of, and many things I am proud of, but it's all a journey, and I'm exactly where I'm meant to be. And if I can really like tap into that and truly believe it, because sometimes I don't, <laughs> there are those moments where I'm like, why, what, what is this? You know, silly moments, even like seven kids or six kids and a baby right. Right. on top of me. And I'm going, I, I can't do this. Or why am I here? It's a really beautiful message to keep with yourself because God is only going to put you exactly where you're meant to be. And he's going to always give you the strength to get through it. Just got to tap into it. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you for being here. It's an honor. <laughs> you, you are where you're meant to be. Yes, I'm meant to be here. <laughs> and, we, and we value that. We Thank, you. That. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. It's an honor. It's an honor and pleasure.